Cheers guys, the Tech Prepper. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're gonna do a quick after action report on that trip I did to the Grand Canyon. Lots of X factors there, lots of new gear and a new mode. Let's check it out. So this particular exercise is really a continuation of my no random contact series. The goal was to establish a targeted contact with a known quantity. I have established a contact with this gentleman, Mike Kilo Charlie 8, Oscar Whiskey Lima before, but we've done it closer to my home QTH. In this scenario, I took the family to the Southern Rim at the Grand Canyon, was a bit farther north than I typically am, and Mike and I had a distance of about 150 miles point to point. And we had a lot of new gear. For example, I have been evaluating now for about four months the Panasonic FZ-M1 and specifically a new keyboard for it that really changes the operating of this system. So it's never a good idea, in my opinion, to try out new gear for the first time uh, in an emergency scenario, but this was a training exercise. And in terms of the rest of the gear for the entire station, it's just in these two little bags. So let's take a look at the first bag and uh, I'm not gonna pull everything out. Actually, let's pull everything out. So I have the QDX by QRP Labs. This is a five watt, five band transceiver and it's the low band model. This will cover 20, 30, 40, 60 and 80 meters. And for this exercise, we did some analysis uh, using VOACAP and it looks like the 40 meter band given the time of day was the perfect thing for us. In fact, this actually only puts out based on my battery and how I ran this thing, about 3.8 watts on 40 meters. Now for the battery, I absolutely love the Talent Cell. This is a 12.6 volt battery. I essentially just hook it together, little bit of Velcro to keep the two together and then just have a couple pieces of uh, cable. One is the DC cable and the other one is the USB cable to the computer. So this is the entire digital station. If bringing new digital components wasn't enough for an X Factor, I also decided to test out for the first time in a new location, my custom TTP MCOM link dipole. And in this little bag, uh, not all of this stuff comes with my antenna, but I do have some RG316 feed line with a little bit of cordage and carabiners, a little bit more cordage. And then I have the 20 meter section, and I showed this on the video. There's actually four more links here that will take you to 80 meters if needed. So everything was brand new, and if not to make things more complicated, yep, we also did a brand new mode on top of it. So I am very late to the party, about maybe four years behind, and I was using JS8 and specifically JS8 call as the digital mode for us to establish this contact. Now the big question is why did I go with JS8 and JS8 call? Well, it was really the QDX. It forced me into that mode because this can only do very select digital modes and JS8 is one of those modes. Now the other thing that's nice about JS8 is the ability for it to work with very weak signals Typically when you have some transmissions that are very far in the noise, you're kind of out of luck, but JS8 call is very good at picking up those signals, even like below minus 20 dB, which is perfect. So I went ahead and sent another QDX to my friend Mike, another battery pack and one of my antennas, and we went out to go ahead and put together a quick communications plan. Let's take a look at the communications plan and I decided to handwrite mine on the back of my comms field manual. Uh, I will be distributing these to the Buy Me A Coffee folks when it's ready. It's nowhere near in sight. So I didn't have access to a printer so I just wrote it on one of the back pages. Now I'm new to writing comms plans. I actually try to put blinders on when I go into radio so that I can fail by myself and kind of experience everything first before kind of taking on what others are doing. So please keep this in mind. This is written from the perspective of a newbie, but I have written about five or six comms plans uh, while we were doing the no random contact series. So I always like to start with the objective and the really just two. It was to establish a HF contact using JS8 call on minimal power. And then the second one was really to field test a couple pieces of gear, and that was my MCOM link dipole, the TTP MCOM link dipole, which is sold out, thanks guys, and also uh, the QDX. So we really wanted to put this through its paces, specifically in a field scenario. I'd like to put down when. Uh, this was uh, the 12th uh, of this month at 2200 UTC, and I selected 2200 UTC because that was the time that we had close to 100% 
prediction success reported by VOACAP, and I've talked about that in the past. Who was involved? Obviously me and Mike Kilo Charlie 8, Oscar Whiskey Lima. The how for this communications plan, quite simple, JSA call, and then the band and frequency. So we wanted to be on the 40 meter band and specifically use the JSA call calling frequency on 7.078 megahertz. Now we did have a schedule and the schedule was fairly straightforward. So at 2200, the goal was to submit a heartbeat. And the reason for that was for each of us to announce to all of the other operators running JSA that are on the network that, hey, we're here, this is my signal, or how's my signal, things of that nature. So we had five minutes to kind of heartbeat, and I believe we put it at 15 seconds. So we sent out about, what was that, 20 heartbeats in that time. At 2205 UTC, the goal was to try to establish a direct connection with each other. And I'm going to go through the rest of the plan. There were some fails I need to talk about. If for some reason the direct message did not work, the goal was to leave a message in, or actually if it worked, we wanted to try leaving a message in an inbox, like on that, on Mike's station or a message from him on my station. Uh, five minutes after that, it, we wanted to identify other stations that were also heart beating that could hear both of us. And the goal there was, let's say that those first two failed. The idea was for Mike to find a station that I could reasonably hit and for him to leave a message there for me in the event that I was having issues and then vice versa. In fact, I did have issues and the when I went out, I went out for a uh, kind of an eval, kind of gear testing deployment one day, everything worked fine. Went out for the actual comma window, got there about an hour early, set up everything, uh, did my gear check, got on, and I had a transmission issue. The transmission issue actually was fairly stupid on my part, and it turns out that by default, the QDX is really designed to default to the FT8 frequency, which is four kilohertz be below, yeah. And it's outside of the bandpass. So when I was transmitting, I was accidentally transmitting on the uh, FT8 frequency instead. So we kind of screwed up that window. And then I went back the following day, didn't tell Mike I was going out there. And that's what you guys saw in the last video. It was more redemption day. And what was cool was even though I missed that scheduled combo window, uh, Mike's station was fine. We were able to use that inbox feature. Mike actually per the plan, found a station in two stations in California and left me two messages on their persistent stations. So 24 hours later, I was able to go back in the field, set up, and I was able to ask, hey, does anybody have any messages for KT7RUN, me? And two stations that are like, yep, we do. They gave me their message IDs, I asked them for the message, and I was able to get that. Even cooler than that, while I was going through that exercise without telling Mike, Mike actually was uh, listening and he had his radio on the air. And we also established a targeted bi-directional contact. So this was 100% a success. And I'm very grateful that I put those details in the communications plan to have basically the idea of one, sending a message or joining the network and putting out a heartbeat for a few minutes. Two, trying to do direct message, even though that failed the first time. Uh, trying to leave an inbox message. Uh, we also had looked at doing a relay through another system, but we could not do that because we couldn't see each other. And then the coolest part is this idea of asynchronous communication where I technically could have a malfunction or not even be on the air and Mike can leave a message for me on someone else's station. So that is why this little device is so powerful. You have the ability to keep this running. I run mine 12 hours every single day from 5 a.m. local time to 5 p.m. local time and just have it completely running unattended. So I may do some JSA call intro uh, 101 videos if you guys want, and it'll be from the perspective of someone who's brand new to it. A lot of power in what we did here. There are a few other things in this plan I want to talk about. Uh, we also had a uh, exchange that we wanted to pass back and forth because the payloads are fairly small. So our plan was just to uh, transmit our radio. So I put QDX, our power level, five watts, and our antenna, and we both put our twin TTP MCOM link dipoles. Now there were some, uh, a couple of issues. Like I said, I had an issue transmitting and I actually thought it was some software configuration issue, but no, 
it was the fact that when I booted this thing up, I failed to put it on the JS8 call calling frequency. So I was transmitting four kilohertz out. So that's now part of my new SOP to check that. In fact, I have a little software project where I'm putting a quick mode feature and it's gonna set everything you need for a particular operation right down to uh, the mode, the software, the settings, and also the frequency. So that's coming probably in about a month or so. What's interesting too is when I went out for, I think another training exercise, I was not able to decode any of the transmissions, but I could see them on the waterfall. So JSA, JSA call, sort of similar to FT8, uh, is somewhat dependent on timing, but the cool thing is that you can fix the timing in the field without GPS uh, and without having access to the internet. So there's a cool feature in JS8 where you can take a look at the waterfall and you can align your clock offset or clock drift with another station and you don't need to worry about do you have an NTP server and an internet connection or even a GPS signal. I did not know about that really cool time sync feature since I was so new. I actually use the, the time date control command within Linux or I put hours, minutes, and seconds. And then I quite literally used my GPS enabled watch and hit enter to sync it within a second. And that was actually a poor man's technique I used in the field, but I should have known better and had read the entire JS8 call manual first and realized that there was already a feature within JS8 call to synchronize your clock so that you could do proper decodes. So by and large, I'm gonna call this exercise a success because at the end of the day, we were still able to use our communication plan and without going through conventional methods like cell phone and internet, we were still able to exchange our messages. It did take a couple days, but we did it per the plan. So I'm gonna call this one a winner. A couple of other cool things. You can't beat the size, weight, and form factor and the simplicity of the QDX based on this exercise and my experience. Also that 3000 milliamp hour battery and all the batteries in general did a fantastic job out there and had no issues, especially since this was a targeted comms window. Like I said, with the battery pack that I'm using with QDX, I'm running my station heart beating every 15 minutes for 12 to 16 hours per day. And I've only worn down the battery to 40%. And then with my even with the refurbished batteries, I'm getting about five hours on the flush batteries and about 11 on the extended. So really no issues there. Actually, all the tech freaking worked. The antennas worked. It was just operator on my part during our actual combo window. Envis communication, I talk about this a lot. Near vertical instant skywave, and that's basically the ability for us to take uh, certain, uh, depending on which bands we're working, uh, basically 40 meters and below, depending on time of day, of course, and season and solar cycles and all that stuff. That's typically the first band where you're able to get regional communication characteristics on the order of 30 to about maybe 500 miles. And it basically allows the RF signal to have very high takeoff angles, come down and shower the area. So Envis was a winner. Mike and I were within 150 miles. And again, on 3.8 Watts, using JS8, we nailed that. So the antenna that I built, the TTP MCOM link dipole was 100% specifically designed as an Envis antenna at deployment heights very, very low. I deployed it at seven feet with the ends off at about like five or six. And actually at the house, I deploy it a lot lower. So the Link dipole that I designed absolutely turned out to be perfect. And again, it's super lightweight. And then I have frequency agility of five bands without carrying a tuner. And then again, big takeaway, uh, the cool thing with JSA is weak signal mode. We were able to nail this on very low power. Uh, we both had good signals. I think Mike had like a plus 10 dB signal. So not an issue, but I was able to pick up weaker stations. And then the ability to go direct to another station use a intermediate station as a relay, and the ability to leave messages in other people's inboxes are a game changer. Those three features are actually gonna be going into my MCOM tools software package. It's a user interface and a few other things that supports plug and play, but I'm gonna have some higher level features sitting on top of JSA call. So I don't have to deal with all of this nerd crap of left click, right click, mouse. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of software, but I want just a big fat button to say, send message to so-and-so. And then under the hood, 
I'm gonna have my software do automatic routing of messages and figure out the correct path, do automatic in inbox uh, pulls and all of that cool stuff. Because one thing I did learn was that at least for JSA call, if you're using a touch device, it is nearly impossible to use it without a mouse and left, right mouse button clicks. The one nice thing about this iKey keyboard, I bought mine for about 320, which is pricey, but I think prices have climbed, is that you have a pointing device and left and right mouse. So this is a full functional keyboard and allowed me to do all of that stuff, but I'm moving to a model based on that experience that will eliminate the mouse altogether. And that's some custom software that I'm not planning on releasing uh, publicly until next year and privately until Christmas this year for the buy me a coffee guys. All right, before we close, there's a few other things that I'm doing. Uh, we are doing now daily practice nets. I'm sitting on uh, 40 meters every single day. I start up my station at 5 a.m., shut it down at 5 p.m. And I wanna have daily practice because I was so new to JSA Call when I recorded that video. We're also bringing in and trying to build a network. So the Buy Me A Coffee members, these guys are all now starting to buy similar pieces of gear. We're trying to train them up on this software. And the more operators we have on the network and the more people we have using that mode increases our ability to have an effective offline, off-grid, HF only, weak signal mode method of passing communication. So we're working on that as well. We're also working on SOPs for JSA call. Since the message payloads are fairly small, I'm working on a set of field procedures whereby we can put a very small payload that other people can consult. And basically it's like QSY or change frequencies, bands, mode, whatever, to WinLink for further messaging or switch over to uh, FL Digi and FL Message where we can do larger payloads. So I'm trying to figure out all of this from a very, very practical angle. So stay tuned for a lot of JS8 call stuff. Uh, there's probably a bunch of stuff that I'm missing. Uh, oh, one other thing, read the freaking manual, RTFM. I don't know if the millennials are using that expression anymore, but uh, read the freaking manual. There's a lot of stuff. I wish I had done that. At any rate, guys, Big thanks to everybody on Buy Me Coffee. You're absolutely amazing. There's gonna be a ton of stuff coming your way in particular, but I do wanna thank everybody else on YouTube. You guys are fantastic. Be strong, be safe, and be prepared.